Hello and welcome to the Comic Cave. I'm Ramsey, aka Captain Away, and today I'm looking at the 1989 crossover event story, X-Men Inferno. Following Fall of the Mutants, which I covered about a year ago, so be sure to check out that video for some good background info, Marvel was looking for another big crossover event for the X-Men to lead, since Fall was apparently such a big success. And it made sense for there to be one, because Fall led to such drastic changes for each of the mutant teams that they simply had to be building towards some explosive new event. Arguably, the least affected by that event was the New Mutants, although that's saying something considering considering that they lost their teammate, Doug Ramsey, aka Cypher, to his only weakness, bullets. It marked a transition for the New Mutants away from the more silly, juvenile adventures that had defined the series prior to this and toward a more grown-up, darker and depressing period as they began to trust their teacher, Magnus Magneto, less and less. His name's not actually Magnus Magneto, I just wanted to call him that. They also saw Ilyana Rasputin, the new mutant known as Magic, and younger sister of X-Man Colossus, seem to grow more and more corrupted by her demon side from the time she spent in Limbo as a child. Limbo in the Marvel Universe is basically hell. It's a dimension full of demons that Ilyana had fallen into at six years old and came out of again as a teenager almost instantly, because time passes differently there than it does here. In the time that she spent there, she had learned to use demonic magic, defeated Limbo's ruler in battle to become the new ruler of Limbo, and gained control of these things called stepping discs that are part of Limbo and allow her to teleport instantaneously anywhere where she needs to go by passing through Limbo first. X-Factor also saw a number of changes. In the previous story, classic X-Man Angel was genetically altered into the Horseman Death by the mutant known as Apocalypse. And though X-Factor helped him remember who he was, he didn't initially rejoin the team and instead went off on his own. Beast, who had been losing his intelligence due to an infection given to him by Apocalypse's Horseman Pestilence, was cured, in a sense, when he transformed back into his blue hairy form after or, I kid you not, kissing a woman whose mutant power was to alter people's genetic structures when she kissed them. Yeah, that was really a storyline in X Factor. Beast does worry that this might interfere with his budding relationship with intrepid news reporter Trish Tilby. But who knows, Beast? Maybe she's a secret furry. Oh. Or, uh, not so secret. Yowza. Then there's the X-Men who all appeared to die at the end of Fall of the Mutants. This, along with the computer virus that wiped all history of their existence, allowed them to essentially disappear from the world and operate in secret against their enemies. Like a mutant version of Section 31 for my obligatory Star Trek deep cut this episode. Got it out of the way in the intro, alright. And they also had the biggest change out of everyone. Or really, Madeline Pryor did. For those that don't know, Maddie was originally introduced as a replacement love interest for Cyclops after Jean Grey died during the Dark Phoenix Saga. I covered that one too. The one notable thing about Maddie was her uncanny resemblance to Jean Grey. That's a, that's a bit of an X-Men joke, you see, because I said uncanny. And because of that one characteristic, Scott Summers, Cyclops, fell in love with her, married her, and ran off with her where they could have a baby together. And as I understand, that was basically supposed to be the end of Cyclops in X-Men stories. Only, instead, X-Factor happened, Jean Grey was brought back to life, Cyclops immediately left his wife and child to run back to Jean, and then Maddie and the baby, Nathan Chris for Summers were supposedly killed by a group called the Marauders. Only the baby was actually taken by a mysterious man named Mr. Sinister, and Maddie was rescued by the X-Men and basically joined their team. Following Fall of the Mutants, though, she made a deal with a demon for power and began to turn against the X-Men. And immediately after that, strange demonic occurrences began happening all over New York City. And I will additionally note that it was not just the X-Men involved in this event. Other Marvel heroes like the Avengers, Fantastic Four, and Daredevil had Inferno tie-ins. 
Heck, the Spider-Man tie-in saw Hobgoblin possessed by a demon, something that would lead to the creation of Demo Goblin, as I've mentioned in a few other videos by now, like my Maximum Carnage review. I'm just saying that's out there too, you know? But for this review, I'm going to focus only on the X-Men stories, partly because they're the main story, partly because they're the only issues in the collection that I'm really reviewing, and partly because this video is going to be long enough doing just that. I mean, just peep how freaking long this intro is alone. So let's hurry and get to the actual story and take this away. The comic opens in limbo as some demons begin plotting their upcoming invasion of Earth. Our main two demons for this story are here, the dragon-like Nastir and the chain-smoking Sim. Can you chain smoke cigars? I don't really know. He's always smoking a cigar though. That's how you know he's a bad dude. Both of these two main demons are very powerful. Powerful enough to challenge magic for her control of Limbo. But you probably wouldn't expect them to be much of a threat given the cartoony juvenile way they're acting. Sim Sim Salabim here is the one currently in charge and he sends Nasty and the other demons to Earth to start collecting babies. And them coming to Earth coincides with the teenage mutants that X-Factor has been taking care of being dropped off at private schools. As you may recall from my Fall of the Mutants video, X-Factor at the time had been working in public under the guise of mutant hunters. But instead of eliminating their mutant targets like they claimed, they basically adopted them and began training them to use their powers. These mutants included Artie and Leech, who had been living with the Morlocks in the underground tunnels below New York until the mutant massacre saw a group called the Marauders, those guys I mentioned earlier, try to kill all of the Morlocks. It also includes the earthquake creating Julius Richter, who goes by the very creative name of Richter. There's also Sally Blevins called Skids because of her force fields that let things slide right off of her. Tabitha Smith aka Boom Boom who can create little time bombs. They go boom so you know the name. And last up is Rusty Collins called Fire Fist for fairly obvious reasons. But man, Skids? Boom Boom? Rusty Collins? Fire Fist? Is this a mutant team or a list of weird sex acts? Fire Fist? Ugh, God, I feel dirty just saying that name. Rusty Collins? Oh God, no, no, that somehow sounds even worse. Fire Guy here is going to jail because he accidentally burned a woman with his powers when they first emerged. And so he's turning himself in to be a good example for his friends. Force Field, Time Bomb, and Earthquake, and no, I'm not gonna call them by their given names because I don't want this video to be demonetized. Hey, that's the first time I could make that joke, yay! Those three get sent to a stuffy private school for rich kids while Artie and Leech get sent to a different nearby school for younger kids. There, Artie and Leech meet the wheelchair-bound Taki Matsuya, who lost the use of his legs after a car accident. But he's a tech genius and, as we'll soon learn, also a mutant himself. Essentially, a technopath who is able to create machines out of other materials. It's a pretty convenient ability for the story, but it's also pretty awesome. I mean, that's definitely one mutant ability I'd be cool being stuck with. Because this comic has to overemphasize how childish and ridiculous it is, the demons sent to search for babies have no idea what babies are. They're just told by Nastir that babies are like humans, but small with bald heads and big round eyes. Since Leech and Artie match that description, hey look, a Garfield cameo. How adorable. Anyway, since they match that description, these two little guys get kidnapped as well. I do love the fake dolls the demons leave behind in their places. Were those supposed to fool anybody? I don't know, but they're super cute. I want one. Taki is the only one who saw the kidnapping and failed to stop it despite discovering his mutant ability, but nobody believes him. So he uses his new powers to turn his wheelchair into a helicopter to go and pick up the older kids from the other school, and they then go to bust Russ out of jail and go on the lam. I'm pretty sure that's lingo they used in 1989. This part mostly seems to exist so they can include their sponsor segment, that good old Pepsi challenge, and show off Boom Boom and her granny panties. 
Hey, no shame. I'm sure they're very warm. They all get dressed up in new outfits to make themselves into an impromptu superhero team they decide to call the X-Terminators, which is the name of the comic, and the name that X-Factor was using when they had been posing as mutant hunters, because Chris Claremont and Louise Simonson were running out of words that had X in it, and the xylophones just doesn't exactly send the bad guys running in fear, does it? Marvel name a mutant team the x Xylophones Challenge. Go! Speaking of X-Factor, the reason the Kid Terminators here are even making this effort in the first place is because they can't just call up X-Factor on the phone because something's wrong with the phones. And obviously, they can't call anyone else either. Quick, what's the number for 911? But the Factor is in the Big Apple as well, dealing with their own problems, as the city has come alive with possessed objects. At least, Beast and Iceman are dealing with that. Scott and Jean have decided to go off looking for baby Nathan, because they learned from the news broadcast of the X-Men's supposed death in Fall of the Mutants that both Maddie and Nathan actually had still been alive this whole time. And even if Maddie is supposedly dead now, Nathan is still out there somewhere. They actually seem to find him, too, in the world's creepiest orphanage, where no one even acknowledges that they're there. In a weird sub-basement level that shouldn't exist under the orphanage where there's a massive machine that seems to be incubating babies or something. Only thanks to the interference of some supervillains who will make more of an appearance after this crossover is over, demons end up carrying all the babies back to New York. Scott and Jean follow to join Beast and Iceman as they deal with the city coming alive. In a bad way in a demonically possessed kind of way. We see the city attacking people in all sorts of ways, like trains trying to drive themselves off the tracks, mailboxes swallowing people for incorrect postage, and the Empire State Building seeming to grow impossibly tall. Uh, I mean, even more so than normal. And we also get a couple Ghostbusters references, cause why not? First, when the X-Terminators are attacked by flying books, and they call out Ghostbusters literally by name. And sure, no human being would throw books like that. The second is a random scene in X-Men where we have some paranormal investigators obviously intended to appear visually similar to the Ghostbusters, at least in their outfits, who end up getting deaded after their elevator gets possessed by some demons. This is why the real Ghostbusters take the stairs in paranormal emergencies. Actually, these guys turn out to be fine somehow and return in a later issue as mutant hunters calling themselves M-Squad. But that's not really important. What is important is that Nastir kidnaps Taki, who by this point is calling himself Wizkid. It's not the best name, but it's certainly better than Skids, Boom Boom, or ugh, Rusty ugh, Collins. Ugh, ugh. Taki is here because one of the demons learns that Wizzy over there... Oh, uh, man... Maybe it is as bad of a name. Anyway, the demon learns that Cheese Whiz there has a spell checker on his computer. And because again, we really have to emphasize the childishness of this story, the demons equate that with the kind of magic spells that Nastir would cast to take control of the world. So they have Taki build a magic spell computer. I'm not kidding, this is legitimately the plot of the story. And to give it maximum effect, they build it on top of a building in Times Square. And I love how they clarify that this is Times Square by showing all the adult shops and peep shows that marked the area in the 80s before, you know, the site became such a tourist attraction that we know it as today, leading it to be, uh, you know, cleaned up different times. Very out of place in this otherwise extremely childish book, too, may I mention. I'm surprised someone was able to sneak that past Marvel editors. Anyway, they use the spell-checking computer and at the same time put the babies that were kidnapped into a giant pentagram in the sky. And this is happening while the New Mutants are trapped in limbo. The New Mutants had been attempting to teleport home from being in outer space to rescue fellow mutant Lila Cheney. It's a long story, they failed, that's all that really matters. And on their way home, they were passing through Limbo like they do, only once there, they couldn't open the way back to Earth. Instead, they were attacked by demons, until Magic gets so angry that she becomes the Dark Child, her very demonic form and excellent villain card in Marvel Legendary deck building game. Time Bomb, Force Field, and Fire Guy are also excellent sidekick cards. 
Oh right, the comic book. Where was I? As the Dark Child, magic has enough power to force her way out of limbo, especially with the giant floating demon summoning gate hanging above the city and weakening the barrier between limbo and earth. But once magic opens the gateway, she is unable to close it again, and the already demonically possessed city becomes completely flooded with actual demons. So all the various teams, including the X-Men, who had finally made an appearance, began facing off against the demons appearing everywhere. The X-Men came to New York looking for the Marauders, wanting some revenge on them after the whole mutant massacre thing, and they're very conveniently all identified for us on the right side of this two-page spread. Oh, Vertigo, that's her name. That's the one who got eaten by the Predator X and Messiah Complex, until all that remained was one spirally boob. Say la vie. Meanwhile, Nastir and Sim fight for dominance, both wanting control over magic in the hopes of becoming the ruler of both Limbo and Earth. Now that Limbo and Earth are becoming one and the same. Sim has the upper hand due to his being infected with the techno-organic virus, which is a complicated thing I'm not really going to explain right now, but it essentially makes him both demon and computer. And a large focus of the story so far has been on how it takes longer to cast spells on Earth than it did in Limbo, which is why Nastir wanted WizKid's computer in the first place, because computers can cast spells so much faster even though you still seem to have to cast spells with the computer, so actually it seems to take the same amount of time, but whatever. Since this is obviously a real thing, and not just an incredibly flimsy plot device to draw the younger mutants into the story and make them seem important to the event, Nastir allows himself to also be infected with the trans mode virus, and then uses the techno-organic virus's ability to consume the life force of other beings to drain and weaken Sim. Transformed into a computer demon thing himself, giving him this new Hot Rod Red alternate cosmetic skin, Nastir plans to use his spelling computer to make himself the ultimate power. But thanks to some heroic intervention from Taki, who literally has to crawl his way there after some demon stole his wheelchair, his attempt to fuse with the computer is interrupted and the computer in Nastir explode. With the dragon demon seemingly out of the way, Sim turns his attention to Ilyana, who has been being tortured by the possessed city in order to trick her into using her soul sword, a weapon literally made from a piece of her soul, to kill an innocent. By now, she's also gone even more demonic, or at least so they say, turning into this awesome metal-clad night angel demon thing. I don't know what it's supposed to be, but it looks pretty cool. Colossus also shows up, having separated from the rest of the X-Men after they seem to have given in a bit to the demonic influence all around them. He joins in the fight against Sim, because as a good older brother, he's supportive of how his little sister chooses to express herself, even if he doesn't necessarily agree with it. But the real help comes from the rest of Ilyana's team, the New Mutants. Recalling that all time is the same in Limbo, Rain, aka Wolfsbane, heads into Limbo to try and pull child Ilyana out before she can be trapped all those years and lose her innocent soul to the darkness. While some of the New Mutants are busy doing this, others are working with the Exterminators to rescue the babies trapped in the pentagram, flying about in little airplanes that Taki was able to make with his mutant power. Again, awfully convenient that he was here for this adventure and that his ability emerged right when it did. Once all the babies are rescued, the gateway to Limbo starts to close, and all the demons, including even Sim, are pulled back inside. At the same time, Ilyana just seems to erupt with light, burning away into just a burned out shell. But since we're not done making Ghostbusters references just yet, it turns out Ilyana is still alive inside that demonic shell. Not only that, she's a little child once again. Weird. Yes, this story brings an end to teenage Ilyana and makes her once again a sweet, innocent little child. And everyone celebrates that she has a bright and beautiful life in front of her and nothing bad will ever happen to her. Oh. Um, moving on, because yes, there is more. Yeah, just in case you forgot, this is an X-Men story. Um, supposedly. Most of the rest of the comic focuses on Madeline Pryor, which is why I spent so much of the intro explaining her. Here we see that the demon power she was given has convinced her to adopt a new personality for herself as the Goblin Queen, complete with wearing practically no clothing because for Claremont, women wearing almost nothing seems to be a sure sign that they're evil. I'm sure that says nothing about his brain. The Goblin Queen wants basically two things, power and her baby back. Baby back, baby back. 
which she gets thanks to Nastir delivering it to her. Uh, well, both things, really. And she even shows up to X-Factor to basically taunt Scott with his own son. She also turns Jean Grey's parents into goblins, which is just plain mean. Those poor people, they've been through a lot. And because I know you're wondering, yes, she's in Marvel Legendary 2. I'm sure it was very, very, very much on your mind. And yes, Nastir was working for the Goblin Queen, but only as a sort of ruse. Sim and young Nasty Man wanted to use Maddie's growing power to expand their reach into the real world, but her power soon grew beyond their control. We learn why when Nasty takes Madeline to her son at the beginning of the story, only for them to come face to face with Mr. Sinister. And I know this is a weird aside, but as a kid I always thought that Sinister was supposed to be some kind of like, drag queen or transvestite. I mean, you have to give me that he's pretty fabulous. Anyway, Mir Sinister here explains to us what most people probably already guessed, that Madeline is a clone of Jean Grey. Apparently, Sinister, who had been alive for a very long time by this point, it would seem, discovered teenage Scott Summers in Jean Grey, and decided that their genetics would make for a very powerful mutant baby. So he went ahead and prepared himself a Jean Grey clone, just, you know, in case anything bad ever happened to happen to the real one. And sure enough, Jean would end up dying on the moon during the Dark Phoenix Saga. Only it turns out that apparently that was not Jean at all, but instead a copy made of her by the Phoenix Force. Jeez, how many clones does this lady have? Who does she think she is, Spider-Man? When that Phoenix Force copy of Jean died on the moon, it tried to send its power into Jean's real body down on Earth. Only she rejected it, and so it found a close enough approximation. Mr. Sinister's clone of Jean, Madeline Pryor. This would wake Madeline up, and Sinister would send her out into the world, manipulating things so that she and Scott could meet, fall in love, marry, and get it on. Once they had a baby, Sinister would attempt to dispose of the whole thing. The comic literally states that it was Sinister's influence that led Scott to abandon his wife and child in order to return to Jean, and that he was, quote, too good of a person to have abandoned them like that of his own accord. And like, I'm so sure. I'm so sure that he had a real difficult time leaving behind the weird off-brand version of the woman he actually wanted to be with for the real thing. Yeah. I bet. But even Sinister doesn't seem to have known about the Phoenix Force inside of Madeline, and the demon deal she made only really awakened that power. And she chose to use that power mostly to influence the X-Men, to make them start all acting like bratty, hormonal teenagers as they fought over love triangles and Madeline even seduces Havoc, her brother-in-law, who had quite possibly always been in love with Maddie even though it was Scott that ended up with her. And this bleeds through into when the X-Men finally finally run into X-Factor in New York during the Inferno event. Which, it should be noted, is the first time the two teams have actually really met. They vaguely knew of each other's existence, and X-Factor had seen the X-Men supposedly die on the news like everyone else, but that was about it. The X-Men didn't even actually know that Jean was alive, other than Wolverine had smelled her scent during the mutant massacre, and Storm discovered it at the very beginning of the story when she sees an interview with X-Factor on TV. But Maddie had manipulated the X-Men to believe that X-Factor actually was acting legitimately as their original X-Terminator counterparts, or in other words, as actual mutant hunters. And with the other influences she's put on the team, she's able to leave the two teams fighting while she flees to the Empire State Building to try and complete the spell to permanently connect Limbo and Earth since we're still at that point where that's the goal. Havoc joins Maddie, still devoted to her, as her goblin prince, and his outfit is ripped and shredded to resemble hers. So, you know, at least the uniform is gender neutral. But Jean, who has had a psychic connection with baby Nathan this whole time for no explained reason, realizes that Maddie intends to kill the baby as the final sacrifice to keep the portal to Limbo open permanently. And since the baby is somehow able to relate this complicated information to an adult Jean, the Gobby Queen is none too happy that even her own baby seems to have chosen Jean over her. Like father, like son, am I right? So she sends Nastir to kill Jean, and this finally gets the two teams working together, and they put aside their differences so they can decide on an attack plan to defeat Nasty. 
Since he's now basically a living computer, they first have Iceman freeze him. Then Storm quickly overheats him, creating a nasty storm system immediately around the Empire State Building. Then, with his system already taxed to the extreme by the weird weather, Storm hits him with a lightning bolt and he simply explodes. And with an explosion that big, he's gotta be really dead, right? He obviously won't appear again in some later story without explanation. I'm sure of it. But Madeline did survive the explosion, and that leaves the X-Men fighting her. Mostly, this is a showdown between her and Jean Grey, until Jean basically absorbs both the Phoenix and Madeline, and they all become one. This finally ends the spell linking Limbo and Earth, and the Empire State Building returns to normal, and so do Jean's parents. Beast also dubs Angel as Archangel for the very first time here. He had started helping X-Factor early on during the event, but ever since Fall of the Mutants, he's only ever referred to himself as either Death or Dark Angel. Now that he's been so helpful in this event, Beast decides he could use a new nickname, and the legend was born. We're still not out of the story yet though, believe it or not, because having merged with Maddie Pryor, Jean now has many of the Clone Woman's memories, including memories and controls put in place by Sinister. Psylocke telepathically links everyone to Jean so the two teams can learn of Sinister's existence, and that he might have something to do with the X-Men mansion. So they travel there looking for him, the first time these guys have been there for a long time since it's been just the school for the new mutants and everyone else has been off doing their own things. Instead of finding Sinister though, all they find is the Marauders once again and some copyright infringement. Shh, nobody tell DC. They capture the Marauders leader Malice, currently trapped in the body of Havoc's former girlfriend Polaris, and they threaten to kill her to learn the location of Sinister. And since the X-Men still seem to be under the demonic influence affecting them from Inferno, they might just do it. We'll never learn though because right then the X-Mansion explodes for no apparent reason and the X-Men and X-Factor are all knocked unconscious. They quickly come around though to discover that their attacker is Sinister himself. He quickly reveals himself to be an unstoppable force, unbothered by any of their attacks. Even Rogue's attempt to drain his powers only ends with him essentially taking control of her body for a short time. The only one not attacking Sinister is Cyclops, because he seems to be unable to do so. As we have been slowly learning, Sinister was present at the orphanage that Cyclops grew up in, and he apparently used the time to experiment on Cyclops, creating some kind of mental block that prevents Cyclops from using his mutant power on Sinister. The X-Men managed to surmise that Sinister must fear Cyclops his power, and that gives them an idea. Havoc provokes Cyclops and shoots at his brother with his own plasma beams. Since they're brothers, they are unable to hurt each other with their powers. Instead, they just kind of charge each other up like batteries when they use them on each other. Once Cyclops is powered up enough, and once he sees Sinister kissing Jean for no damn reason, and may I mention that's the second time someone has kissed her in this story without her consent, Rose, Cyclops loses control of his eye beams and they blast out of him at full force, burning Sinister down to his skeleton. And after a blast like that, he's gotta be really dead, right? He obviously won't appear again in some later story without explanation, I'm sure of it. The comic then just immediately ends, with the two X-Teams dismissing their infighting without really apologizing or even discussing it. And then the X-Men return to Australia while X-Factor strike a dramatic pose in the ruins of the X-Mansion. Content that they saved the day and rescued little baby Nathan, who certainly has a bright and beautiful life in front of him, and nothing bad will ever happen to him. Oh. Oh, right. Oh, shit. Um, let's just get to the breakdown. It's a little weird that this is an X-Men crossover, considering that the X-Men are pretty incidental to the story. The comic is mostly about the New Mutants and the Exterminators, with X-Factor picking up most of the rest of the story, and the X-Men pretty much take a back seat. I guess it's all considered basically the same thing though. But that's fitting because this event is about as childish and cartoonish as they come. Despite dealing with some pretty serious subject matter, it's all wacky kid stuff going on and the villains all have to act extremely stupid and incompetent in order for the kids to not, you know, get themselves killed being in the situation they don't belong in. 
And since it bends over so far backwards to allow for this juvenile lunacy, it makes the threats presented to the adult characters seem not that frightening. It's not so surprising then that they choose this time to make so many Ghostbusters references. Because this is 1989, that's not the year of the first movie. That's the third year of the real Ghostbusters cartoon, and the year the second movie came out. That's peak Ghostbusters for kids time. It's clear Marvel thought that their audience could and would only ever be little kids, rather than random 30-somethings just waiting around for the internet to be invented so they could bitch to thousands of people online about just how bad Marvel was screwing up. <clears throat> um, yeah. But I do want to clarify that I'm not saying that childishness is bad on its own or can't be in a story, just that it is actually annoying here. Especially in The Exterminators. Writing in that kind of style is definitely not one of Louise Simonson's strengths. And it's also annoying here because the X-Men have always been about the sort of, uh, shall we say, banal evil of racism? The complicated push and pull between good and evil that comes from hate, fear, and ignorance. X-Men presented a very grown-up subject that requires so many shades of grey to a young audience that it's no wonder it struck such a chord with older audiences. But this comic, with its demons and angels drawing very specific lines of what is good and what is evil, is then basically the antithesis of what X-Men is. If we can just blame the entirety of destructiveness of racism, sexism, and homophobia on demons, removing that blame from humans entirely, then what even are the X-Men doing? What's the point of them? If people can't be convinced to repent their misdeeds, why does this comic exist at all? And even if you're one of those who's like, I'm not here for the politics, I'm here for the fights. Well, first of all, why the hell are you reading X-Men then? What's wrong with you? But second of all, I don't know how even you could enjoy this comic because there's so much pointless nonsense going on here to allow the children to participate that it just kind of ruins everything else going on. So, what I'm basically getting at is that I'm giving this series a recommendation level of... low. Honestly, the New Mutants and X-Factor issues have some pretty great story beats, so well done, Louise Simonson. But the X-Men issues feel pretty forced in there, and the X-Terminator issues are absolute garbage. So, shame on you, Louise Simonson? I just don't know how to feel about you as a writer. The Collected Edition gets... one... Artie Effigy. I'm telling you, those things are awesome. And this collection is admittedly pretty good. I'm reviewing based on the X-Men Milestones version, and Marvel has been doing a great job with those. It's around 500 pages of comic, plus it includes a bunch of bonus art, covers, promotional material, and several pages of information giving background and context. I would love to see more of these Milestone collections, please and thank you, Marvel. Thanks everybody for watching and especially for subscribing. This is my first video after hitting 1,000 subscribers and I can't thank you all enough. This is amazing. I hope to never let you down and that you'll stick with me for a long time to come. Or at least until next time when I cover some more classic X-Men. And I hope to see you then, right here in the Comic Cave.